Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new, welcome. Today is part three out of three of my zookeeper series. Um, so videos about becoming a zookeeper. So my very first video was um, how to become a zookeeper. The one I just put out was zookeeper interview tips. And then this one is just gonna be a zookeeper, zoo educator, zoo career Q and A video. So I asked you guys on social media to ask me your questions about my job, my experiences, becoming a zookeeper in general, whatever questions you have that maybe I haven't answered yet. Ask me what you wanna know and this would be the video that I answered them all in. So you guys asked a lot of amazing questions. Um, so we're gonna get started answering those. If you see me looking down, it's because I have my laptop next to me and I typed out all of your questions. Um, that way I could film using my phone. Um, so yeah, and some of them were really hard, so I had to like think about them. So I wanted to make sure I did that before I filmed the video, otherwise it would take me a long time to film this video if I had absolutely no idea how to answer the questions. <laughs> so we're gonna start off with my questions from Twitter. So the first one I got was from Morticia and she asked, what do your weekly schedules look like? Do you stay on site some days or go out? Um, I, as a zoo educator, go off grounds almost every day. It's not very often that I stay on grounds all day. This summer I did because I was a camp counselor for the summer camp, so I was on grounds with the kids every single day. Um, but now that summer camp is done and I'm doing zoomobiles and booths and whatnot, I'm off grounds almost every day. Usually I only have a program a day. Um, we're not as busy now as we were in the summer. So I usually only leave at least once. Um, but sometimes we'll go out if we don't program. Then we'll run some errands, pick up things we need for birthday parties or whatever else we might need. So yeah. So the next question is from Leslie and she asked, what is your worst and best experience working with animals? So I have a lot of bests. I'm not sure what I would pick as my best of the best, um, but basically some of my favorites were getting to feed um, a male sea lion during my very first internship. That was really cool. And they look big, but they're like, when you're close up, they're even bigger. And then getting to do like his training with him and give the commands and whatnot and having him actually respond. That was super amazing. Um, being face to face with our male polar bear was, well, not like face to face, like there was still like the um, fencing in between us, but I was cleaning his holding cell and there's this little spot between the holding cell and the exhibit that he can come into and he likes to sit in there and watch you clean. So I was cleaning and didn't realize that he'd come in. So I turned around because my back was like right to that section. I turned around and he was right there like staring at me. That was amazing. He, I think they said he is one of the largest polar bears in captivity. So he was ginormous. It was the coolest thing ever to experience. And then I guess the last one I'll end with for my best is being trained on raptors and birds of prey. Um, that was something I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to handle birds of prey and my job now as a zoo educator allowed me to finally get to learn how to do that. So I have handled a barred owl, a merlin, and a red-tailed hawk. Um, once I feel really confident in all three, um, we do have a new red-tailed hawk that is flighted. So that's going to be a huge difference from the other three that I've worked with that aren't flighted. So I can't wait to get experience with her but obviously I wanna feel super comfortable on the three non-flighted birds first. So I am feel super confident with the Merlin. He is my favorite. He's the second bird you train on and he is my favorite. So yeah, but it's been super exciting. I actually love working with the birds of prey. Um, and then my worst experience, I don't have any like really, really bad experiences with animals per se. Like I have an internship that I didn't really like overall, which was my aquarium internship. I've talked to you guys a lot about that on this channel. Um, but if I had to pick experiences with animals that were my least favorite, it would definitely be cleaning up river otter poop because their poop is the grossest poop that I have ever had the pleasure of cleaning. It reminds me of an egg yolk or just like the egg, like the inside of the egg when you crack an egg and it comes out and it's like weird consistency. That's what it reminds me of, and it's really gross. Um, 
and cleaning sea lion poop out of their baskets when I was a life support systems intern. Um, and I'd clean all the filtration systems and whatnot, having to reach in with my gloved hand and scoop out sea lion poop and throw it away. That was pretty gross. During my sea lion internship, I never had to experience sea lion poop, but during my life support internship, lots of sea lion poop. All right, so the next question is from Jeremy's Wild Studio, also from Twitter. And he asked, what zoo animal is the most fun to feed and which is the worst to feed? So for me, my favorite one to feed has been the sea lions. Um, I enjoyed making their diet. I, when I got to feed the male sea lion, that was one of the best moments of my life and like all of my experiences feeding that male sea lion was hands down one of the best things I have ever gotten to do. Um, and the worst, I'm going to say penguins. Just because I hated making the diet. It was a lot like making the sea lion diet, but I didn't mind doing that. I hated making the penguin diets because every day I went in for the internship, that was basically like all I did every single day because I got them out of having to do it. They didn't have to teach me anything because they could just send me to the kitchen and make me do diets. So, um, yeah, it was fun. I only got to feed them once and it was like right before I left for the day and I only fed one because I got to do target training with it and, um, it, it was cool, just nibbled my fingers and it hurt a little bit. You gotta be really careful when you're dropping uh, fish into those beaks. It wasn't like, I don't know, it was, it was fine. I think I just overall didn't like it because that internship was my least favorite and because I always got stuck making pink one diets and I just really wanted to move on from that. <laughs> All right, the next one is from Julia. And she says, what animal are or were you most excited to work with? And what animal were or are you least excited to work with and why? So like I said a couple of minutes ago, the ones I was super excited to work with were the raptors. Um, so our owl, our falcon, or our merlin, and our red-tailed hawk. I was so excited to work with those. I've always been super excited and like wanting to learn how to handle them and whatnot. Um, just because, excuse my language, but I think falconry is so badass. I really wanted to learn how to handle them because I think it's so cool. Those animals are amazing. And so like the whole scenario was super exciting for me. And actually now that I have gotten to work with all three of them, birds of prey actually have come up as a second favorite for me. Reptiles will always be my number one, but working with raptors has come up as a very close second for me. I am becoming very passionate about it and I absolutely enjoy it. So the ones I'm least excited to work with are preschool animals for sure. And what I mean by our preschool animals is our duck, our chicken, and our rabbit. I can speak for most of us on the education team when I say those three are our least favorite animals to present because there's not much to say about them. It's really hard to talk about domestic animals. So yeah, but kids love them. They're great for preschool kids, especially the rabbit. The duck hates me, first of all. I keep trying to make friends with him. He hates me. Um, the chicken's a chicken. She's, she's cool, she's a chicken. And the rabbit, there's really nothing to talk about with the rabbit. She's a good girl, I love her to death, but there's nothing to talk about with her. So those three I was not too excited about. <laughs> okay, the next one is from Hannah Herpetology on Twitter. And she asks, what is the most challenging part of being a zookeeper? So, I have a serious answer and then kind of a personal answer. So I'll start with the personal answer because it's kind of, I don't want to say funny, but it's like, whatever. Um, so the worst part in all of my experiences interning with keepers is having to dump bags of salt. So this would be sea lion keepers, polar bear keepers, anything that is a saltwater animal that has a saltwater pool, you're having to dump ginormous bags of salt. It sucks. Those bags are freaking heavy. There was one time I had to empty a whole pallet 
which I believe was about 49 bags. And each bag, I forget how much they weigh, but they weigh a lot. And that internship was during the summer, so it's extremely hot. And it was just, it was miserable. I hate bags of salt. After that, I said I'd never work with a saltwater animal because I never wanted to have to dump salt. And that was something I did once or twice at my um, aquarium internship was having to dump salt because obviously an aquarium has lots of salt water. Never again. I hate dumping salt. But now on a more like serious note, I think for everyone or mostly everyone, the hardest part of being a keeper is that you are very important to the lives of the animals and a lot of people see that as something that's really awesome about zookeeping and it is but what it makes it not awesome is you miss out on a lot you don't get a whole bunch of vacations you miss out on the opportunity to travel a lot you miss out on holidays so Christmas with your family, Thanksgiving with your family. When you've been around a while and you have some seniority, sometimes you get those holidays. But when you're the new man on the totem pole or the new man on the chopping block, you're usually the one that's stuck working Christmas. So you miss out on holidays with your families. And I think that is like the whole sacrifice you have to make with your life, your holidays, traveling, freedom. Um, there's a lot of sacrifices that you make to be a keeper and I think that's overall the hardest part besides obviously all the physical labor. <laughs> it's that uh that mental part. Oh also you have to work no matter the weather. So my first internship there was like a huge snowstorm and I wasn't sure that I was gonna be able to make it to the zoo but I tried. I got up I was out there shoveling out my car when they texted me and said that the zoo was going to be closed for the day due to weather so I didn't have to come in. However, all of the keepers still had to come in to care for the animals. So you also had to work no matter the weather because those animals, their lives depend on you being there caring for them. So the next question is from Judge Judy Official and she actually had three questions. So the first one is what courses do you need to take to become a zookeeper and do any include difficult math? So basically just anything that has to do with biology, um, ecology is really good too, but just a general one would be biology. But a lot of colleges have courses and majors designed specifically for people that want to do things with animals like zookeeping. For example, my major was animal behavior, ecology, and conservation. A lot of zoos have a major in zoology. So it really depends on the college, but basically if you just have a basic biology major, um, that's typically good enough. Um, do they include difficult math? Um, it depends on the program. I, for my major, had to take a statistics. Um, I ended up getting to take a psych stats though, so it wasn't quite as hard as a math stats. I think I would have had to take another math course just as something the college itself required, but I got credit from high school for taking pre-calc and calculus. Um, so I didn't have to do that. I just had to take the stats that was required of my major. So it just depends on the school or the degree. Some don't, some do, some like mine only require just the stats. So her second question is, is the income a livable wage or is it paycheck to paycheck? Um, typically you will find that zookeeping is paycheck to paycheck. However, it is livable if you know how to budget. If you are very good at budgeting and you are good at living below your means, it is doable. I was doing really well. I was budgeting. I was doing paycheck to paycheck budgeting. I'm still trying to do paycheck to paycheck budgeting. So each paycheck is um, assigned to a different bill or to my rent or whatnot, different payments I have to make monthly. Um, I assign to each paycheck. And then whatever's left over from that, I take out what I need for gas for the two weeks. I take out like 20 or $25 for groceries and I take out whatever I need for my animals. If I have to buy them food, if anyone needs new lights, whatever I need for them, I'll take out what I need for that. And then I put the rest into savings. Lately, I've been struggling a bit more and it, I'm living more paycheck to paycheck because I started my Etsy shop. I started Herpetology and you can't start a business without spending money. So I have put a lot of money into starting my business 
but now I'm to the point where I'm hoping that just making sales, um, I'll get that money back and then start to turn a profit. But I have spent a lot of money starting up this business in the shop. So right now I am living to paycheck to paycheck, but before I started my Etsy shop, I was living decently comfortably because um, I don't go out and buy fancy things. I wasn't buying new clothes. I'm not buying like all sorts of fancy food. I literally live off of like chicken and eggs. That's about it. <laughs> so I like, there's not a lot that I need to spend money on. So I was living very comfortably. So it just depends on how you handle your money. Um, and then the other reason that I've been struggling is because I do have a neurologic disorder and that it's really bad with the changing of seasons and with weather like rain and we're changing into fall it's getting colder and it's been raining a lot so there's been a couple of days that i've missed work and um i don't have pay time off yet so i'm just taking hits on my paycheck so that has made me struggle quite a bit lately but starting to turn around now so her third question is what is the demand for zookeepers and what good jobs good in caps could you take that aren't being a zookeeper with a degree for it? So a job as a zookeeper is a very sought after job. There's a lot of people that want it. It is very competitive and it is very hard to get your first keeper job. So typically you can't be too picky when you're applying for your first job. Because once you get your foot in the door and you have that first job to put on your resume and to prove that you can do it, then it's easier to get other jobs and to compete for other jobs. But when you're someone that hasn't had a legitimate zookeeping job yet, it's very hard to compete with those that have. So it is a very sought after job. Um, it's definitely not easy to make it in the field. Um, and then what good jobs could you take that aren't being a zookeeper with a degree for it? Um, I'm assuming like you're asking what other animal related jobs you could do um, besides being a zookeeper. Um, other jobs, you could be a researcher and do field work. You could be a college professor. Um, let's see, you could be a zoo educator like me. And so I'm not technically a zookeeper, I'm an educator. And I feel like that's sometimes a little easier to get into because if you have kind of an education background or education knowledge, um, that plays a pretty important role in the position, not just being a zookeeper. Um, you could work for a nature center as a naturalist. Um, so typically nature centers will have animals that you'll have to care for, but you'll also be doing education programs. You could look into becoming a rehabilitator. Um, obviously you could become a vet, but that also takes pre-vet and vet school and all those crazy expensive things. Um, but you could look into becoming a wildlife rehabilitator. So all you have to do is typically um, take some train do some training um get your license and yeah um you could also be involved in ecotourism i'm not entirely sure what jobs are in that but i know several people that graduated ahead of me wanted to be involved in ecotourism so basically what that is is um visiting other areas like tourism but being environmentally friendly with it so making sure that when you travel you're not disrupting the animals that live in those places or their habitats um so you're being environmentally friendly with your travels so there's a lot of different jobs with animals a lot of jobs that people don't really think of so you really just have to like look into it um do some volunteering somewhere or different places to get different experiences because then you'll kind of find out what it is you really want to do all right the next question is from lady vader and she says what animal behaviors was most different from what you expected so um, our, we have an African crested porcupine in education and when you walk down there and you walk over to her enclosure, she runs right up to the gate to say hi and she comes up and sniffs you and that I was not expecting the first time I went down there when she was down there. Um, I thought she would try to stay away from you and cower in a corner or something and like, oh my gosh, don't touch me. But she came right up right up to the fence um, to say hi. So that was awesome. Our possum, Daisy, um, I always thought possums were super cute, but I'd never handled possum before this job and they're so snuggly. It's crazy. Like obviously don't go snuggle a wild possum, but Daisy was raised by people. Um, she was a wild rescue. 
and she just you pick her up and she just clings on and cuddles to you the whole time and it's super awesome um our american porcupine widget he will climb onto your lap and more or less snuggle with you um which is awesome except for the fact that he really stinks because porcupines are smelly um and lastly i think our chicken i mentioned earlier that the chicken's not my favorite to work with but i thought it was super cool that she will perch on your arm like a, any other bird would so if you get her up and she can balance on your hand or on your arm she'll just perch there like a bird of prey would so that was super cool all right and the next one is from zoe gemini on twitter and she says do you have any bad experiences with exotics or bigger animals so i haven't done too much with really with like large exotic animals um if I had to say that I had a bad experience with any animal, I don't know that it was like really bad. It was just very intense. Um, I helped with a wallaby knockdown. So a lot of animals, when they get checked up by the vet, they have to be knocked down so that they can be up close and personal with the animals and do their check routine, um, clean their teeth, whatever it is they need to do. And we had a wallaby who was very flighty, very stressed and wouldn't really cooperate under anesthesia so they had to be very careful with the whole entire thing and i was there helping because he they had to keep the anesthesia very light um but he because of that he wasn't really out as much as they needed him to be so the whole situation was just very intense and i ended up getting involved in it because we needed more hands on in the whole process so it was just it was very stressful. <laughs> um, next one is from Morgan and she says, do you feel like you have enough zookeepers slash staff members so the animals get the best care possible? Or do you feel understaffed and overworked? So I will say for most zoos, they have enough staff. Um, it's not hard to find keepers to replace other keepers because that job is so sought after. So typically zoos will have enough staff and even if they don't the animals care is always top priority and they always make sure that they get the best so sometimes staff may be overworked but the animals are always getting the best care my zoo personally uh, i know we are a bit understaffed in the keeper department um but i know that they are working on bringing in more keepers they just recently brought on two new keepers to the team um, so I will say that some of our keepers may be overworked, but our animals always receive the best care. Um, it is hard for me to say for certain what is going on because I'm not a keeper. I'm not on the keeper staff, so I don't really know what's going on. Some keepers seem much better off than others. Some seem a little stressed some days, but I think overall, um, doing fine. Animals are always living their best life. <laughs> um, I will say for education. We are not understaffed by any means. When they hired me, they hired me and another guy. Um, and this is the first time and I guess, I don't even know how many years they've had this many educators. So they're very excited about that. I think there's just been the two main educators for years and years and years. So we're definitely doing very well in the education department. Um, I do just wanna also add that my zoo, it is a very small zoo um, and kind of not in the best area compared to like other zoos like we're not a big city we're not like the Bronx Zoo or the San Francisco Zoo or Omaha Zoo or anything like that um and the pay is not as great here as it is in those other areas um so it is hard to get people to come here um we have awful winters we kind of live close to like the middle of nowhere <laughs> and it's a small zoo so there's less money so there's less staff so the zoo is working with what it's got but they're doing really well with what they've got all right next question came from daydream and they asked what would your life be like if you never had the chance to be a zookeeper how did it affect you as a person it's a good question so if i never pursued becoming a zookeeper i would probably have gone through and just become a graphic designer or a digital artist or a photographer or something like that. Um, I do have a second major in digital media arts because of my love for graphic design 
Um, I used to get paid to do design work for different skating clubs in my areas for their ice shows. Um, so everyone told me like, oh, you should do this in college. So luckily the college I went to did have a digital media program. So I double majored with that just for fun. Um, but I definitely got a lot out of it. I learned a lot. I learned about video production and all this other stuff. So that was pretty cool. So I probably would have pursued a, um, more of a job in the arts. Um, how did it affect you as a person? Overall, this whole journey to becoming a zookeeper has affected me because my whole entire life since I was four has been revolved around becoming a zookeeper. I never really thought about anything else as far as a job goes. I never really got to experience um, like sitting and thinking about all different possibilities of what I could do with my life. It's always been zookeeper, zookeeper, zookeeper. It's like never faltered. Um, and it also made me very aware of the problems in the world very early on. Um, I was online researching different conservation topics and different animals from the moment I knew how to use the internet. <laughs> so from a very young age, I was very aware of conservation topics and problems with the world. So that's always been a big passion of mine. Um, so basically that's how the journey of becoming a zookeeper has affected my life. Um, Tor Reptiles asks, if you could reincarnate as any reptile of your choosing, what would it be and why? Probably a Komodo dragon because they're really freaking cool. And excuse my language again, badass. They are badass. I love Komodo dragons so much. I would say like a Grand Cayman Blue Iguana since they're my favorite, but they're severely endangered. And I don't really want to reincarnate as an animal that is severely endangered. So um, we're gonna go with the really badass one, Komodo Dragon. All right, Hunter Hawk Official asks, what is your favorite species to care for? So in a zoo setting, my favorite that I've gotten to work with so far would be river otters, despite the fact that their feces is disgusting. Um, they are actually a lot of fun to care for. I enjoyed making their diets. Cleaning up after them wasn't bad once I figured out how the heck to efficiently clean up hay. Hay sucks. But once I finally got a handle on like all the tips and tricks for really getting it good, um, I didn't mind that at all. And they're just really stinking cute. So, um, otters. If we're talking just in a general sense and not just in a zoo, iguanas would be my favorite hands down. Out of all my animals, my iguana is my favorite to care for. All right, New Bird Reptiles asks, can I keep a pet owl in Illinois? So I got a lot of questions about owning an owl after my last Instagram post yesterday where I was holding Grace, our barred owl. Um, she is the zoo's owl, not my owl. I don't recommend owning birds of prey. Um, most places you cannot own birds of prey unless you are licensed, whether you're a licensed falconer or a licensed rehabber. Um, I think you have to have a special rehab license for birds of prey. It just depends on your state. So I have no idea what the laws and regulations are in Illinois. Um, if you look it up on your local DC website or go to DC and figure out for your state what it would be, um, then you'll have a better answer than I can give you, but I do not recommend keeping birds of prey as pets unless you are like a falconer or something. Um, I wouldn't recommend it personally. Um, however, if you really want an experience with them, I would recommend finding a rehabber that you can volunteer with that works with birds of prey or some facility that has birds of prey that you can volunteer with. That way you can get some experience with them before you even consider getting any sort of licenses to own one. All right, Sweet Creatures asks, what makes a good or reputable zoo? That is a really stinking good question. So anyone else that got asked this question would probably jump right to saying if it's AZA accredited. If a zoo is AZA accredited, boom, it is good. Not necessarily always the case. There are really good AZA zoos and there are really good non-AZA zoos. I talked about this a little bit in my last video. Um, sometimes, you know, it's really expensive to become AZA accredited and some places would just rather take that money and put it towards their animals instead of an accreditation. So you can't really judge a zoo based on whether or not it's AZA accredited. Um, however, if it is accredited, 
odds are they're doing something right because they have to get inspected and pass inspection and pass all they have to have all these certain like things done to become accredited so to a certain degree they've got to be somewhat good but that doesn't mean that they're like totally 100% like awesome um basically any zoo that puts all of their animal needs first is a really good zoo if you can tell those animals are being enriched and really well cared for you know that is a good zoo um also a zoo that values their education and that really takes a part in conservation whether it's through education or sending keepers out into the field um there's a lot of zoos that do that and that's another way you know a good zoo is not only are they caring for the animals in their care but they're sending people out to help with wild populations and that's really awesome it's important to remember that if you see an enclosure that isn't naturalistic it doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad some zoos like just mm, how do i want to explain this a lot of animals in zoos didn't come from the wild so they don't really know what their habitat is supposed to look like and sometimes zoos make enclosures that aren't naturalistic because they're more so aiming for functionality if they know certain things animals need like primates some primates really need like climbing opportunities they'll focus on that rather than making it naturalistic because as long as it suits the animal's needs and that they can act and use their behaviors in a way that they would in the wild, then it doesn't really matter. A lot of times the naturalistic aspect is more for visitor perspective. It's more to make visitors happy. A lot of times it doesn't affect how the animal does. However, if a zoo goes that extra mile to make their enclosures look naturalistic and function well for the animal, then that is a win-win in a really good zoo because if the animal has enrichment and the enclosure functions in a way that is really good for the animal, but it also looks naturalistic, so it's really appealing to a visitor, then that is a win-win and a really good exhibit. So if a zoo has naturalistic enclosures, but is still enriching for the animal, that's a good zoo. So there's just a lot of things that can factor into whether a zoo is good or not. A lot of zoos are pretty good, but they have a couple exhibits that aren't up to date. So it's important to remember that even if you see a zoo that isn't quite up to the standards of today, there's a lot of zoos that are trying to make their exhibits better and make their zoo better, but costs a lot of money. My zoo that I work for is extremely, extremely old. A lot of our exhibits are outdated. However, they are working on updating the exhibits. We all know that the exhibits, a lot of them suck, but you can't do anything without money. So that's where it's really important that people keep supporting the zoo because then the money that they make from people coming to visit, they can use to update those exhibits. So zoos aren't getting a lot better overnight. It takes a lot of time because you have to have money, you have to have funding, you have to build. Um, so just because a zoo is if a zoo, if you think a zoo is bad because their exhibits seem old and outdated, know that that zoo probably knows that and they're working on making it better. It just takes time and money. So it, that's kind of a hard question to answer because there's so many factors that can play into it. All right, so next is moss, moes, moes, moss, reptiles. I'm sorry, I don't know if it's moss or moes, reptiles. On Instagram asks, do you believe degrees are critical to succeed in the field? I always say, or I did always say that you needed a degree. Now I know that that's not so much the case. I think you could get away with not getting a degree if you have enough experience to back you up because ultimately experience is the most important thing. However, most places are requiring a degree because it separates the people that are applying for the job. Because if you have a degree and experience, they're going to rank you higher more than likely than people that just have experience and no degree so it's going to look like you went that extra mile and that you're super serious about it um so i would say if you can get a degree it would probably be in your best interest to do it however a lot of people can make it in the zoo world with just experience like if they start volunteering at a zoo from a very young age and they stick with it 
a lot of times that will help you get a zoo job without having to go to college for it. CJ Zoo asks, what are the best and worst parts of the job? Um, because I already talked about the like best and worst parts of zookeeping earlier, I'm going to talk about the best and worst parts of being a zoo educator because that is my job. Um, the best is definitely that you are the one that visitors and that the public see. Um, you're the one that's going out on the zoo mobile with the animals. You're the one that's doing the birthday parties. You're the ones doing the education programs. So as much as the keepers are the ones taking care of the animals, the educators are the ones that people see and the, the ones that kind of represent the zoo. And then on top of that, you're the one that is initiating these really cool experiences and education experiences for these people. A lot of times we go to programs and I bring animals that kids have never seen before and they're getting to see them for the first time and they're getting to touch them for the first time. And you're the one that is making that experience happen for them. So that is the really cool part of my education job. The worst part is probably when you have those really bad programs where the kids just aren't, or the, the kids, the people, could be kids, could be adults, just aren't interested in what you have to say. Um, a lot of times kids would be just more interested in the fact that you're there and they get to touch the animals. That's all they care about. They don't want to listen to facts about the animals. They don't care what it eats. They don't care how it defends itself. They don't care about any of that. And they make it quite obvious. Um, sometimes you'll do birthday parties or go to programs where the adults use you as a break from having to control the kids. And they kind of step back and just chit chat with whoever while you're the one in charge. And if the kids don't want to pay attention to you, it makes for a really crappy program. <laughs> um, the other hard part is not getting to be hands-on in their care. Uh, most zoos, the educators are the ones caring for the education animals. At my zoo, it's not. They used to, um, but now they have a designated education keeper and the educators simply just educate. Um, however, I am supposed to apparently be getting to do a little more hands-on care with our education reptiles because they know that's what I want to do. So looking forward to that. Vin's picks asks, is the job hard? Well, this kind of goes off of the last question and because I already talked about like the hard parts of zookeeping, I'll talk about educating. Um, is the job hard? There's two main things for me that have been hard in this job. One, remembering all of the facts for all of the different education animals. We have a lot of education animals. Now, luckily, I had it kind of easy coming in because most of our reptiles are ones that I own. And because I did education programs at the Nature Center, I already knew facts off the top of my head about a lot of them. Or if they're like turtles, I had that down from the Nature Center. So then I just had to learn the ones like the ferrets, the hedgehog, the porcupine, the possum. But mammals aren't my strong suit. So I had a really hard time remembering information about them where reptiles come very easily to me. So that was very hard, remembering all the information for all of our different education animals. Um, and the other hard part for me is driving. I hate driving. A lot of people enjoy driving. They think it's soothing, like whatever. Um, I have a neurologic condition, like I mentioned earlier, that tends to flare up with long distance driving. And a lot of our programs are at least an hour away. I tend to do okay with an hour, but some of them are two hours away. And sometimes we've done three hours away. So the driving part for me kind of sucks. I hate driving. <laughs> All right, so the last question is from Fluffy Jellyfish Chloe on Instagram. And she says, what experience and degrees do you have that helped you get your job? So my job as an educator, um, basically my degree would be animal behavior ecology and conservation with a minor in zoo biology. So I have a very good understanding of the zoos and how zoos work. Um, I also have tons of internships at zoos and aquariums. But to help me get this job specifically, I would say things that helped me most were I had a class that was conservation education. So we learned about education, relating conservation to education, and we did a lab with local public schools where we made lesson plans and taught them to those kids. Um, I have over a decade of coaching experience for figure skating. So I have been working with kids almost my whole life <laughs> since I was in fifth grade, working with kids skating once I could move up to becoming a just coach, not just a coach's assistant, but a coach, I did that. So I think I was either a freshman, I think I was a freshman in high school when I became a coach officially. 
So um, I've had over a decade's worth of working with kids in skating. Um, I was a naturalist at my nature center, so I basically did the job that I have now. Um, so that really, really, I think, helped me get this job was the fact that my job as a naturalist there was basically the same thing that I do now as an educator at the zoo. Um, and it also definitely helped that I was doing reptile education programs with my animals. Um, so basically what I do now, I was already doing with reptiles that the zoo has. So I was able to jump right in as far as reptiles go. All right, so thank you guys so much for all of your questions. Thank you for tuning in and watching all these videos. Um, of course, if you guys have any other questions that you maybe just are now thinking of, you can leave me a comment. You can always message me and ask. I get tons of questions all the time from people that want to become zookeepers or become educators or just want to get involved in zoo, the zoo world or the animal world. Um, so I get questions all the time. So you guys always feel free to message me. Thank you guys so much for watching this video and we'll see you for the next one.